Concrete was first used 5,000 years ago by the Egyptians, but the Romans perfected it, as demonstrated by the many structures that still stand today. These concretes are similar to those of the early 20th century. In the first half of the 20th century, the epic expansion of the United States infrastructure was in full swing. As our country scaled up to meet the massive electricity and transportation needs of the country, demand for high quality and sustainable concrete reached historic proportions. Portland cement was in use, but in combination with the age-old materials the Romans used, natural pozzolans. The construction of hydroelectric dams, highways, and bridges cannot be developed fast enough to support the modernization of the country. This rapid expansion of the U.S. infrastructure continued over decades through World War II and into the early 1960s. Only by the limitations of sound engineering and construction practice. Day by day, week after week, the top workings of the structure approached its full height of 730 feet, far above the crest of any other dam yet built by man, or likely to be built for years to come. I'm Jim Pierce, civil engineer. Uh, finished my career with the Bureau of Reclamation back in 2006, and I spent uh, over 30 years with reclamation. Yeah, my name is Doug Hooten. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in civil engineering, and I've been working in concrete area for over 40 years on supplementary cementitious materials, durability of concrete, and uh, performance specifications. My name is Tim Dolan. I'm a consulting civil engineer. I've been working for about four or five years consulting on dam projects around the world, specifically roller compacted concrete dams. Um, but before that, I was a uh, worked for the Bureau of Reclamation Concrete Laboratory for 33 years. My name is Bud Warner, more specifically Orville Warner. I first became involved in concrete, in producing concrete aggregates when I was going to college. And I got out there and I used the loader and I did all sorts of things and tested concrete aggregates. Once I got out of college, I started working for the Bureau of Reclamation. And as such, I was an inspector on a concrete-related project here in Colorado. After two years, I came to the Concrete uh, Research Division of the Bureau of Reclamation in Lakewood, Colorado. And from that point on, for 13 years, I was involved in mass concrete jobs, which the Bureau of Reclamation typically did. My name is Michael Thomas. I'm a professor of civil engineering at the University of New Brunswick. Um, I've been working in concrete materials since 1983 when I started my PhD. Um, I did my PhD at University of Aston in Birmingham, since worked for the Building Research Establishment in the UK, Ontario Hydro in Canada, University of Toronto, and now I'm at the University of New Brunswick. My main interests are research into the durability of concrete, with particular emphasis on the use of supplementary cementing materials, including natural parts of lands. Um, my name is Marie Jackson. I'm a research scientist at UC Berkeley in civil and environmental engineering. And I work on ancient Roman concrete and prototypes of those materials using volcanic ashes. Number one benefit is in reduction in, in alkali aggregate expansion. Large dams, even small expansions, can be quite difficult to mitigate. Um, and to have a very long service life. Our dams that we were working on were intended to last 75 or 100 or more years. So the long-term volumetric stability of a massive structure is extremely important to its service life. I do believe that we have a significant infrastructure crisis right now. Structures that were built a long time ago, actually built very well, are nearing the end of their service life. And in that context, they were built using the best materials, the best quality of construction, and they took 
a lot of consideration on the long-term durability. What I see now is a rush to build things bigger or faster and cheaper and with very little uh, um, consideration for the long-term durability of the structure and who's going to pay for it when it has to be redone. When you compare natural pausons to fly ash, there are some striking differences, obviously, even though they all are specified under ASTM C618. For instance, fly ash itself is a very round particle, very easily makes concrete more workable. We're used to that. Natural pozzolans are ground up much like cement is, and so they're a little bit harsher particle, and they may require a little bit more water or water-reducing admixture or a difference in proportioning to make them as desirable from the standpoint of durability and water-cement ratio and that sort of thing. Fly ash, on one hand, has a tendency to have carbon in it, and this carbon is very disruptive to building concrete structures in freeze-thaw environments because we want to put air in it. Natural pozzolans don't have this particular problem. So they are certainly different materials and as such need to be treated, I believe, independently in assessing how good they might be for any particular project. I think what we have to do, which is difficult to do because we have uh, a century of specifying things prescriptively is we need to look at performance specifications. Our ability to, uh, just things like the increased use of porcelains, um, understanding more about the you know, water cement and materials ratio, the need to use water reducers, the, the advent of super plasticizers, all of these have led to concretes with much improved performance. The ability to pump concrete now, improve placing techniques, curing techniques. If anything, I would say, at least concrete these days has a potential to be much more durable than it was 40 years ago. Yeah.